What is one of the worst things that could happen in your lifetime? Maybe a close loved one dies. Maybe your pet that you've lived with and grew up with for 15 years suddenly died. Not suddenly, I mean 15 years, that's a long ass time for a dog. But I'm um, moving on. Maybe you got hit by a truck. And, but maybe college got paid off because that truck turned out to be owned by the university. I don't fucking know. Listen, the point is, there's a lot of terrible things that could happen within your lifetime. But out of all of those things listed, nothing could ever be worse than being contested inside of a game of TFT. That is some bullshit, but we're gonna run with it. Sometimes you'll get contested in TFT, and it's gonna suck ass. But that doesn't mean that the game's automatically an eighth just because you got contested. Being able to find alternatives and variations within some lines that exist that may seem like they might not have any other variations available is one of the strengths that you need to develop if you want to become great at TFT. And in today's video, we are once again VOD reviewing the Dark Horse King, Juku, and once again, one of his regional final games from day three, because again, this guy is a stellar professional TFT player. He is so, so good at the game. And we will get to watch what exactly happens when a top tier TFT player plays in a lobby where he is also contested against some of the best in North America. Let's get on to the video. Here we are, we are now inside of Juku's game. And as you can see right off the starting carousel, we have a bunch of tiers, a bunch of belts, a bunch of crit gloves, meaning that this lobby is gonna be pretty AP focused because again, a lot of tiers, not really any good AD components. Sure, crit glove is okay, but nobody really likes starting off with a crit glove just because like if you hit a double crit glove, you're forced to kind of slam TG, which isn't bad, but it's not great. And then on top of another thing too, just the more crit gloves you have, the harder it is to kill them. Sure, again, these gloves is great, but it's technically pretty inefficient overall because you're not getting the ideal items that you want for whatever carry you're trying to play around. Here we do have though, Ezreal Pair and a Vi. So, we're kind of leading towards in underground here, and again, the Ezreal from the orb is a bit of a high roll. It opens up lines like Kai'Sa, opens up stuff like Hold the Line with Rel. I mean, Quick Draws in general, it's sort of less favored in the current meta just because it's not as strong and it got nerfed to the ground, but that doesn't mean it's still not playable, right? So here at 2-1, we are getting Hero Augments. I mean, this doesn't need a lot of explaining, right? I mean, this is just, none of this is very takeable. No duelists. The only Anemo we have is the Nasus pair, and Invigorate is never that great to take. So it's a very, very easy reroll here. Rising Spell Force, you should take this every time. If you have an Ezreal pair and an open tier, open rod, you should take this every single time. The only problem is, though, is that you may have noticed, he did not scout. This man did not scout, which I don't 100% agree with. He should definitely scout to make sure that he is just uncontested because when you're contested for this line, it can be really difficult to try and win out because people are taking the Vi's, people are taking the Ezreal's, and it can be a really bad time. Now, I just want to preface by saying this. This line, we should talk about sort of the direction he's trying to go with before we continue the VOD because it's important to understand where we're going with Underground Rising Spell Force Ezreal. Usually, this line is traditionally played with supers. You play three supers and you just reroll at six and you're trying to three-star everything. Three-star the Vi as your main tank, three-star Lee Sin, three-star Malphite, and three-star Ezreal. But, the meta has sort of changed a little bit. Oh, and by the way, once you get your cash out, you tech out Sona for the, for the Kai'Sa. This was the original idea, the original Rising Spell Force board. Things have changed though. People have realized that if you do the math, it turns out that four quick draws is just stronger. It's just a thousand times stronger than just playing around supers and trying to max everything out here. So you're better off that as soon as you 3-star the Ezreal, 3-star Vi, you push the levels and trying to tech into the quick draw as soon as you can. And as well as maybe 3 starting this Lee Sin just because there's another Brawler as well that's a 2 cost you could potentially roll for. But if there's any other supers players, any Lulu players, you're, this isn't happening and you can flex whatever, some form of Aegis, some form of Brawlers or whatever. Yada yada yada, you get the idea though, you, this Vi is going to stay on your board because this is going to be your main tank. What does this also mean? This means that whenever we're trying to play Rising Spell Force, anybody who's taking augments like, well, Rising Spell Force, but also any augments like Unrelenting Force, Vi's carry augment, you're gonna have a bit of a bad time. Because you'll be contested because they're looking for the Vi 3 stars who's supposed to be your main tank, and things can get a bit difficult, right? It's really not that great to be playing a reroll comp when, you know, oh, and here, by the way, Setsuko playing Unrelenting Force. So already, we are we are contested in this lobby, so we're not gonna have a great time, right? It's gonna be a little difficult. But anyways, like I was saying before, we are going to try and need to find a way to stay afloat, even though we are only rerolling basically for this Ezreal, which again, it's pretty inefficient. When it comes to two-cost rerolls, 
you want to be, or any reroll comp to be honest, you want to be looking for multiple units that you can 3-star. So for example, if you're ever playing like the Camille Hacker board, you're looking to 3-star Pike, 3-star the Camille. And if you're playing stuff like Lulu, you're trying to 3-star GP, 3-star Malphite, 3-star Lulu, 3-star your supers in general, right? In general, you're looking for multiple units. That way your rolls don't feel as inefficient. The only exception to this rule is something like the Sivir reroll comp where you are playing time and a half. But even then, people have sort of deviated from the traditional rolling at six for Sivir 3 and actually rolling at seven for it because you end up playing three-star Shen and three-star Sivir. So again, we're seeing a lot of reroll comps and traditionally speaking, trying to find multiple units to three-star, right? Because we don't want to be so inefficient with our rolling, right? Because let's say we see multiple two costs that we can't pick up. Like, what's the point? You know what I mean? So now what do we do, right? Again, we've spoken about the main line. <coughs> Excuse me. We've spoken about the main line. We've spoken about what we're looking for, right? The three-star Ezreal, the three-star Vi. What do we do in this situation? What do we do when we are contested? Whenever we are contested for units that we know that other people are searching for as well, we need to be we need to be smart about it, right? We need to start thinking about, okay, what is our out, right? And there are typically two different answers to this problem. The first one is just hit. Just hit. As we can see here, Juku has five Ezreals at 2-5. Just fucking hit. Sometimes that happens, right? Sometimes you get lucky, you just hit all the units and they don't. Hold the hands and just pray that you're the one that hits. But obviously there is a bit of an unreliable sort of factor in this and that is you're not always going to hit. More dog is not always going to bless you on certain games. And even though he does hit five Ezreals pretty early, that doesn't mean that he's going to be able to hit that Ezreal three, right? He's ahead. He's definitely farther ahead than anybody else. But, you know, Setsuko might find all the Vi's and that becomes a problem. So what do we do in situations like these? We need to start thinking about different sort of lines that exist within the augment and find a way to play around it. That is the big one. So what does this mean? This means that whenever we're playing lines like these, we start thinking, okay, sure, we usually have Vi3 as your three. What can we change instead? What are the core what are the core components that we can keep and the core components that we can sort of forfeit and try to move on from here, right? So the core, again, as your three, Vi3. We don't need Vi3, technically speaking. Ezreal 3 is a must. Right, we kind of need the Ezreal 3 no matter what. But this Vi 3 doesn't need to necessarily happen. It's nice to have, but it's one of those things that only exists because it tends to be more efficient for our rolling. So we'll go back to that in just a little bit. We did hit the 3 2 augments. Let's talk about it a little bit. Ascension, Electro Charge, and Salvage Bin. Quite honestly, Electro Charge is definitely not the play. Electro Charge is definitely one of those augments you take because you want to streak during the mid game, but it falls off in the late game. And usually, you take Electro Charge because your team is very tanky. A lot of defenders, a lot of brawlers. It's really great for those types of comps. But in a comp like this, where you only have... People are being loud outside again, sorry. In a comp like this, where Vi is really your only frontline, and for the meantime, it's really, really weak. Ascension, not that great in this spot, because again, our frontline is very weak. The fight isn't going to last very long. So the only really good option here is Salvage Bin. And Salvage Bin, surprisingly enough, is actually quite a popular augment. Because it gives you the extra item, and it's a very flexible way to tech in the extra item. It's not always going to be your best option, but it's an option that still exists because you're able to just break it apart. You're basically saying, hey, this is like component grab bag, um, a little worse in the near future, but it gives me way more flexibility in the long term, and I get to slam items and slam whatever the heck I want. So here he slams Shroud because he knows he's going to eventually sell his Kale, and he still has an extra chain and extra crit club to work around in the future. Again, it's one of those augments that gets really dizzy if you don't know what to do, or if you're just, you know, you don't have the game plan in mind. But again, this is the highest echelon of TFT. This is the elites of the elites, the best of the best. They know what they're doing, they know their direction, right? And as we were talking about earlier, when it comes to direction, we lost our initial, original direction, right? We lost our ability to play the Vi3 because Setsuko is being a little ass hat and he's contesting us. It's fine. It happens. So what do we do? What are some things that we can look for? And again, Ezreal 3 is the core. We cannot give that up. That's something we cannot forfeit in this comp. But we can forfeit the Vi3 because all it's doing is acting as our main tank. So we can think about, okay, maybe we don't need to be playing her as our main tank. Who else can we play for our main tank? A couple of options exist. Any frontline mech is fine. Um, mech is fine if we have a lot of actually sort of frontline irons, but we don't have second win, so it's a little less likely. We could maybe play mech quick draw, we could maybe play just some sort of flex opener, some sort of flex frontline, maybe for Aegis, right? So we still end up utilizing some value out of our Vi. 
But this isn't the only way to think about how to approach our pivot, how to approach our different lines that may exist, right? And you may notice something here. He's been holding on to the Shen on this bench for quite a bit of time. By the way, he checks the admin. It's every five seconds your team gets Tony Mana, one of the best augments in the game for admin. And the Shen is a bit of a tell. It's a bit of a spoiler. If you haven't guessed already, Ju Q has been thinking about playing Hacker instead. Now, why is Hacker even a potential option in this scenario, right? Well, it's a potential option for two reasons. One, and this is way more niche, but as you may know, Ezreal has a bit of a bug right now going on, where if he kills a unit within melee range with his ability, he will double cast. That is a bug that is unintentional, but because the condition is so niche, it does not have very high priority in terms of fixing the bug because it rarely happens. And actually, if we look into the stats of Hacker Ezreal, it's actually really awful. It's quite honestly terrible. Let me just I'll let me just pull it up real quick. But if we look up, let's say three hacker plus rising spell force, it averages a 4.67. It's not very good. So as we can see here, averages a 4.67. Actually averages a 4.04 if you get three star Ezreal online. So maybe it's actually not that bad. It's actually kind of good. So Juki is actually aware of this line. And surprisingly enough, the stats have actually increased on this. Because you might actually notice something funny too. Um, even though the win the average placement is pretty high, the, the top four rate's abysmal, 45%. It's it's quite honestly not very good. Um, it's very unreliable, if you will. But if you manage to hit, then you manage to hit, and it seems to be all right enough, right? As we can see here on the 4-1, he is rolling down trying to hit the Ezreal. And again, whenever you're playing two-star rerolls, you're trying to sort of hit your two-star, three-star by like 4-1, four, 4-2 four, at the latest, right? So as we can see here, he rolls down. He, I believe, has just enough Ezreals to make the Ezreal 3. He is sitting on a duplicator. I think he's one off, but it might have been an APM issue, whatever. But as you can see, we're down to 29 HP. We still don't have our fully, you know, we don't have our board online. We're still playing underground. But here we hit, I mean, it's always Jewel Lotus in that scenario. I mean, we can rewind a little bit, right? We have Uplink. I mean, Uplink, not even bad, to be honest. He has so many components that he can spread. But Jewel Lotus is so much damage that it's probably better. Plus you have blue buff. So you're casting quick enough that you don't really need uplink. Although uplink is definitely a viable option here. You can spread components. It totally makes sense. But here, cash is out. And he notice right before the cash out, he actually only had two items on Ezreal. He did assign the GS the round before because he knew his cash out was coming out and he wanted to make sure that he had the open slot in case he hits a good item for Ezreal. And here, as we can see, he hits the Zhonyas. Now, here we're going to be taking out of Underground. We're going to be rolling down, trying to find the Ezreal 3. We hit, we level, and then we tech into Admins and Hacker because, again, the Admins pretty nice. Every five seconds, your team gains 20 mana. And he flexes into this Hacker version of Rising Spellforce, which is, again pretty niche it's not something that you would see happen very often and it's one of those boards that only really occurs because you were sort of forced to play into this line if you ever get to play rising spell force you definitely want to play the main line with the four quick draw it's way more consistent and vi3 is actually quite a strong tank especially if you have vi3 with like an orn item of some sort or some sort of really nice tank item that you'd get out of the cash out now again like i was saying before this board only exists for two reasons one like i said because of the ezreal bug but two it sort of exists as sort of a way to bypass this problem that if you haven't noticed, he has no tank items. Juku is stuck on a chain on his Vi and not a lot of really great frontline options. You could argue, sure, he didn't pick up any really good frontline options along the way, but you could also sort of make the argument that like, hey, this guy re recognized that like, there's a good chance that he won't be hitting those frontlines early or any good frontlines that would really make sense to play on his board. So instead of trying to force and flex a frontline of some type, he's just going to say, fuck it, fuck all the frontline. I don't need any of that. I'm just going to play hacker instead, which is incredibly smart, incredibly great, you know, it's just solid fundamentals, right? If you know that you're not going to be hitting the tank, maybe consider Hacker as a potential option. Just find another workaround to try to access the backline. If he tries to stabilize with like a really dog shit frontline, something that's not very strong, he's just not going to have a really good time. He's just going to end up, you know, the frontline dies too fast, everything closes in, Ezreal can't clean in time because it needs to ramp up over time. So this is definitely a great workaround. You might also notice he actually slams the locket in the ZZ Raw here. Instead of maybe potentially a GS, or maybe even potentially a guard breaker for his Kaiser or whatever, right? And the reason why he's doing this is, again, he's playing Salvage Bin. I feel like we've been talking about Salvage Bin a lot, but Salvage Bin, again, it's one of those components, that, it's one of those augments, really, 
that it's so cool because you get to slam all these items you wouldn't normally slam in the early game because you know you're slamming these onto units that you're probably going to be selling later. He knows he's probably not going to keep a Blitz 1 on his board on his end game, plus his Vi 2, even though, yes, traditionally speaking, Vi stays on the board, he only has a Vi 2. He can tag off of it. Screw the Vi. He's not playing Underground anymore. Screw that too. That's way too greedy. He's gonna, he knows he's going to sell the Vi later. So he has a bow, a belt, a chain, and a rod to work with. Plus, he also has the Shroud that he gets to hold on to, which, quite honestly, Shroud scales well into the late game. The earlier you have a Shroud, the less value you get out of it in the begin, Or rather, it's less valuable in the beginning, but it garners way more value at the end game. So he could quite honestly keep the Shroud as well. But you may also know something too. In the main line when it comes to Rising Spell Force, usually you're trying to play around an MF2 duo carry. What does this mean? It means that while he's slamming items, he's also thinking about the future. What am I going to play? Who am I going to think about as my secondary carry? He knows he wants to take on the four quick draw, so he's thinking about, okay, if I sell this buy, if I sell this blitz, what components do I have left, right? So what does he have? He has the, he has, what is it? He has rod, he has chain, he has bow, and he has belt, and he has an open sword. This means that he's already sitting on GS plus an open rod, potentially gunblade. Well, yeah, no, no, it's not. GS, open rod, and then open belt. So ideally looking for guard breaker, looking for maybe another sword for gunblade, maybe for archangels, but there is a bit of a problem here. Even though that he wants to play around that and that's his idea for the future, he is sort of struggling with his components at the moment, right? But that's okay because look, he even has to protect his vow and he took the protect his vow because he knows that it's a mana generating item for the future for the MF. So now that tier becomes the archangels uh, and then he has another chain, but he can probably figure something out with that, right? And again, he's thinking really far into the future. He knows his direction, and he knows where it's going to go, so he's going to keep trying to itemize towards the future. And with Salvage Bin, you know, again, it's one of those augments, it's it gets really dizzy, but it's one of those augments that if you know the direction of your board and you can start to keep track of all the components and everything, you're going to have a much better time compared to everybody else. And that's why we're seeing a lot of the pros, especially at the higher, you know, again, the highest tier of TFT. They're taking Salvage Bin because they're not getting as dizzy, right? But here we're starting to see a problem now. We're starting to slowly see a problem with the Hacker Ezreal. And you know what the problem is? The biggest counter to Hacker Ezreal and Hacker anything is Morgana. So we're getting to the point of the game where this guy, he wrote, I need AP. And he says that because he doesn't have a third item for his MF yet, but I mean, he's going to get it through here, right? So, again, the problem with Hacker in general is Morgana. Morgana is a problem because it just locks down the Hacker in the back line. And there's actually another counter to Hacker as well, and there's Leona. So what are we going to see? We're going to see that at a certain point, we're going to be struggling to clean boards with Hacker, and we're not going to be able to clean as well as we used to because people are taking on Morgana, people are taking on what uh, freaking... Leona's in the back line as well. So we're going to be struggling a bit more starting now because now we're 11 HP. One more bad loss and it's over for us, right? And this is why we need to make sure that we have that secondary carry on our board, something like the Misfortune, that will help clean the board in case our Ezreal can't do it alone. Even though this is like probably Gigabis Ezreal, um, maybe Mana Zane over blue buff, but besides that, like this is basically BIS. And again, he knew that he was contested from the beginning, and he knew that there's no way he's gonna hit that Vi two or that Vi three rather. So this is like such this is incredibly flex gameplay. He doesn't notice how he has an Echo two on his board. Doesn't he have Aegis in? He's again just he's just playing whatever he's hitting, and just doing his best to roll with it and seeing where it goes, right? And I think this is something that is so important that a lot of TFT players, especially lower Elo, are struggling with, where they're like. Oh, some, I just got contested. I just got hold. I just got to hold hands. I got to hold hands. We're we're just going seventh and eighth. Me and you, buddy. Let's do it, right? And they just tilt off the face of the earth, and they don't know what to do. They don't know what to do, right? Play what you hit. Play what you hit. Think about alternatives, right? Every hero augment, every line in the game has multiple variations that are less efficient and potentially even less effective. But just because that is the case doesn't mean they're unplayable. And I think there's this really toxic mindset of, hey, I didn't hit the units that I needed, this game is an eighth. Think flexibly. Think flexibly because believe it or not, and this is the big problem actually, this is something that I struggled with while I was in Diamond back in like, I believe in like set six, where I was hard forcing social like Kaisa every single game. I could not wrap my head around the idea of playing any other comp besides social like Kaisa because it was so broken at the time. It's sort of like, it was sort of like the hacker nar of the set. 
But my mind was so fixated on playing around social like Kaisa every single game that I could not do anything besides hard force it. And then I was hard suck like Diamond 3 for like the longest time. There's a lot, a lot of playable lines and a lot of different units that you can play. A lot of strong units that you can play. They're less meta, less niche, less effective. That doesn't mean that they're unplayable. And that is something that if you want to get better at TFT, you need to put that and drill that into your head. As we can see here, even the way that you position your units is really important. I'm going to play this at regular speed because this is an important thing to note. Just because we have hacker on our board doesn't mean we have to utilize it. This is another thing too. For example, as I said before, Morgana, Leona 2s, these are problems that we're going to be facing as we play the game, as we go further into the game because people are developing counters to try and counter our board. So what are we going to see here? What are we going to see here? Juke, you decides to scout here, right? What do we see here? Double counter. Kindle Gem is playing Morgana 2, Leona 2, and position them both backline. Our Ezreal is going to have a terrible time trying to clean it up because Jin is in the third hex here. So what do we do here? What do we do here? We're not going to say, oh, because we're hacker and they're countering our board, we're, we're screwed. We can't do anything to counter our board. No, we can counter this board. How do we counter this board? It's simple. Just drop hacker. He takes the Ezreal out of the hacker unit, hacker spot, and now the Leona and the Morgana that were supposed to be these big counters, even the Fiddlesticks in the back line, these things that are supposed to be the biggest counters for our board are suddenly not countering our board anymore. So sure, things look a little cramped here, and things may look a little difficult, but now the Morgana has a difficult time to lock onto the Ezreal, the Ezreal is able to clean up the Leona before it's able to lock onto him, and sure enough, he's able to clean up here, win out Kindle Gem, who's board again, supposed to hard counter the Ezreal, but now can't do anything about it because we just we dropped Hacker. A bit unexpected to do so because we didn't do that the entire game, but now here we are. We're now in the top two spot, playing a very unconventional way of playing ha of playing Rising Spellforce. And even though we were contested, we were still able to make it out because we took the core components of our original game plan of the sort of best optimized board, took what's important, again, Ezreal 3, and then took everything else that we could sort of say, fuck it, less efficiency, but it's okay, we'll just make it work, teching into Hacker and securing basically a top two. Now, we'll be going into the final fight here as well. Um, I didn't really see what he took here, but I mean, we took a glimpse of the other guy's opponent's board. I mean, I barely even saw it, to be honest. But I mean, let's look at the other person's board. He has, what is this? This is Belvet 2 with Leona with, Leona 2 with BISTG with uh, just threats all around with scoped weapons. I mean, this is winnable, but the Eternal Winter is really rough. And again, we, as we can see in the back line, we have the Leon too, who's there to act as sort of a counter to the Ezreal. So if we were to hack into the back line, it wouldn't be very great. Uh, he doesn't actually... Setsuko does not... Huh! It's Setsuko! Setsuko is actually the one who's securing his first place spot here. And surprisingly enough, if we go back... Again, we can see his augment. It's Unrelenting Force. Let's look at his board again real quick. Actually, this is fascinating stuff. Both players knew they were contested. So what did they do? They said, let's find an out. Let's find a different direction. Setsuko took the third approach that we didn't even mention. Forfeit the Augment. Forfeit the Augment is a two-cost Augment. It is completely forfeitable. Three-cost Augments, four-cost Augments, gets a little less forfeitable. But you can, there are times where you just go, oh my god, I'm contested. I'm contested, there's no way I'm going to hit. This guy, Juku, ended up hitting the Ezreal 3. What am I going to do? Am I just going to roll for the Vi 3 instead? And to try to like win out with the Vi 3? No. Fuck all of that pivot out completely and entirely and try to play for this instead try to play a threat board instead or whatever the fuck he hit he hit the leona 2 he hit the Sintra 2 he hit the belvet 2 sculpt weapons he said he said fuck it i'm gonna forfeit everything and guess what guess what he wins so even though these guys both contested each other with unrelenting force and rising spell force they both said fuck it find a different out that is some stellar, stellar gameplay. They both knew they were contested, so they both said, let's find a different direction. Incredible stuff. Well played from the both of them. Quite honestly, I probably should have VOD reviewed Setsuko. I didn't even realize Setsuko was the one who was winning out here. That actually completely surpassed my expectations, but terrific game. A lot of stuff to learn from this one, and I hope you guys learned something. Happy climbing.